So uh, if you look at your handouts, the revolutionary changes in the Atlantic world, one of the things we talked about yesterday is that there are some reasons for the American Revolution that have nothing to do with the British necessarily being mean to the Americans. But one of the reasons we talked about was the economic background. And we said that back in the 1700s, there was two countries that were the biggest rivals on planet Earth. That was the British and the French. And they went to a war that was super costly called the French-Indian War. And we said that even though on this map, you know, the, the French have everything in yellow or orange, whatever you want to call that color, and the French lose this war, and that's great because now everything purple is the British, but this war was a war that was so expensive that the British had to, in a sense, charge the cost of the war. We said last time that the cost of the war was about $137 million. That's a lot of money, especially when you consider that the British annual budget was only $8 million a year. And like all debt that you pay for, you have to pay interest. And we yesterday said that the interest payments were $5 million a year. So if you're in a situation where you only make $8 million a year, you owe $5 million a year in interest payments, you're going to have to find some ways to pay back all the spending. And the British look at the 13 colonies and say, you know what, this war was for you guys. And because it's for you guys, we need you to pay your fair share. We mentioned yesterday that there's issues that will come up regarding no taxation without what? Representation. Which some of you heard for the first time yesterday, which is shocking, but, but it's okay as long as you know about it now. We also said not only is there issues of money, but there's philosophy that backs up the American Revolution. In fact, what philosophical movement is backing up the American Revolution? The title of the second section, it's called The Enlightenment, right? So all of you should know by name where it says the philosophical background of revolution, and then it says... The Enlightenment, you all should know by name that the Enlightenment supports, backs up the revolution because all of the ideas that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and George, all the ideas that they have come from the Enlightenment. And one of the big things about the Enlightenment is they say that you have to have a reason for everything that you do. There has to be an argument. There has to be an explanation for the things that you do. You cannot say... Yeah, we're going to break up the British because I'm just not feeling it anymore. You know, it's just, it's just not my thing. That's not okay. You have to have a reason. We said yesterday that the Enlightenment is kind of like the scientific revolution, but we are applying those rules to human society. We mentioned yesterday, like in the scientific revolution, people would ask questions. I would ask you, hey, do you believe the Earth's the center of the solar system? And a lot of people said, yeah. Well, why do you believe the Earth's the center? Eh, it's just, I heard it once in church, so I'm sure that's, that's all there is, you know. The scientific revolution is like, yeah, that's not okay. You've got to give me some evidence why the Earth is the center. In the same way, if you told me that you're the king because God made you king, I'm going to say, yeah, that's not going to cut it. I actually need some evidence. I need some reasons for what you're saying to be true. Now, we also talked about a couple of Enlightenment thinkers, uh, scientific revolutionary thinkers like Linnaeus. There's a star on that. You need to do Linnaeus on your own. This is Linnaeus, though. You'll tell me what back what contribution he had. We also talked about this guy, which is Diderot, and he's one of the most famous people who ever lived because he actually wrote the very first what? encyclopedia right and his encyclopedia we mentioned uh made fun of established religion in fact we mentioned last time that he had an article about the eucharist which is the catholic belief that the the bread becomes the body of jesus the wine becomes the blood of jesus and in his encyclopedia he wrote down an article that says eucharist see hannibalism he made fun of traditional established religion that is the thing that Enlightenment thinkers did. They didn't just ask questions about government. They asked questions about God. We also talked about this guy, John Locke, one of the most important men ever to live. He's the guy who gives us our idea that we have 
three, at least three inalienable rights. For John Locke, there's life, liberty, and what third thing? Property. Property. And John Locke also said something bold. He said, if a government does not support those rights, what do you have the right and maybe the obligation to do? Rebel. So he is using reason. He says, these are rights. They're God-given rights. God gave them to you. No government can take them away. And any government that tries to take it away from you means you have the right to rebel from that government. It's not legit anymore. John Locke. We talked about this guy, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote a famous book called The Social Contract. And he said, government is kind of like your cell phone, pl cell phone plan. You pay so much for your cell phone plan. You expect data. You expect text. You expect internet, you expect service. If you constantly get drop calls, if you constantly can't get online, if you constantly have messages that never get sent, you're probably going to change your provider. And Rousseau said government's like a provider because you know what? You get stuff from government. You get roads, bridges, police, protection. You get stuff from government. But what happens if the government doesn't live up to their end of the contract? Do you have to live up to your end? No. In the social contract, he said that the legitimacy of the government is based on, we wrote down this expression, the consent of the people. We said that I give consent for you to be my king. In America today, how do I give consent to Joe Biden or Donald Trump? I vote for them, right? And if I vote for them, I'm giving my consent. And so in Rousseau's thinking, Government is only legit if we give them our consent. And that's crazy because on our handout, we said that that was a challenge to what belief prior to Rousseau about who puts government in charge of you. We talked about something called the divine right of kings. We mentioned last time that people believed that the reason why the king of France is the king of France is because God put him on the throne. And if God put the king of France on the throne, who's the only one under divine right of kings that can kick out the king? God. And that kind of like leaves people like you and me kind of like powerless. We're just people who are exposed to pay our tax money. Divine right of kings. We said there was a parallel in China under something we called the mandate of heaven. We also talked about these two dictators, Catherine the Great and Frederick of Prussia. And we said that they sponsored intellectuals, which is weird because if intellectuals make fun of government, why would I want to hire someone making fun of government to back me up? Well, you might recall that Enlightenment thinkers often question religion. And the reason why I want to hire people that question religion is because if I can get you to have doubts about God, if I can have you have doubts about your God's ability to help you, if God cannot help you, who will you have to turn to to solve your problems? The government. And so the smaller your God gets, the bigger the government has to be. They definitely sign up to uh, higher Enlightenment thinkers. We also mentioned that they helped develop technologies. You know, these, these intellectuals can help us not just with making fun of religion, which is helpful, but also with better guns and cannon, etc. I think we finished talking about, or we also talked about middle class women. And middle class women have developed one of the most dangerous skills you could ever develop as a human, which is what skill? Literacy, right? Literacy is so dangerous that there was a black abolitionist named Frederick Douglass. He's a super famous person you should have heard of. He was friends with Abraham Lincoln. And Frederick Douglass was a runaway slave. And he said that literacy was illegal because white people felt, man, as soon as a black person knows how to read, you've ruined them as a slave forever because they're reading the Bible, because they're reading things that tell them that they should actually be equal and, and free. And so women are reading now too. Middle class women are reading because they don't have to like work or be in the fields or like be in a sweatshop. And middle class women, once they start reading books they like, we said that they start distributing books. They start sharing these ideas. And not only do they distribute books and share these ideas, women, have, middle class women have huge houses. And we, I believe, talked about this word salon. And when you think of a salon, you think of a woman like maybe getting her hair done or whatever. And what do we think about women doing 
while they're having their hair done with one another. Gossiping, talking, and a salon is where these women with these massive middle-class homes that, you know, they could have a living room as big as two, three, four of these classrooms, and that's your living room. Perfect for having a house party. But these house parties weren't about, like, music or, like, watching Netflix night or game night. They would actually have debates. These homes were open to debate and discussion. We call this a salon. So these middle-class women who had been nobodies under patriarchy, these middle-class women who had been, you know, nameless people, all of a sudden they're reading books, they're sharing books with their husbands, they're sponsoring salons, parties in their house with debates and discussion, they start sharing books. These women are important for getting revolutionary ideas out there. Now, our handout also, there's two stars, middle class and books, coffee shops and tea shops. I'm going to actually share with you the page number I need you to look and tell me about the role they played in revolution because it turns out coffee shops and revolution go together. And I'll give you for your homework uh, one of the things you should be looking up so that you can respond to some questions about that tomorrow. Same thing with Ben. I want you to tell me a little bit about Ben. I'll give you the page for him. We also said that at this time, there was a mixed faith, mixed view of faith and science. Thomas Jefferson, would it be fair to say Thomas Jefferson was an atheist? No, atheist says you don't believe in God. And Jefferson definitely wasn't an atheist. An atheist is someone who says there's nothing. And Jefferson would say, that's kind of odd. How do you get everything, chickens and cows and humans and the sun and the carbon cycle and DNA, how do you get everything from nothing? Jefferson would think that's odd, but he wasn't a Christian either. In fact, we said there's a word that best describes people like, like, like Jefferson. What was he? Not a Christian, not an atheist. He was a, a deist. We said D-E-I-S-T. Yes. He, as a deist, believes God's there, but he's just not there for you. He believes that there are, that God is not supernaturally active. There are no miracles. And God was like a what in this analogy? A clockmaker or a watchmaker. You know, if you open up a clock, there's gears and there's springs, there's a design. Like your phone has a bunch of parts. But if you drop and crack your screen, does does Tim Cook of Apple care? No. And if your life cracks, God does not care either. On the back side, getting to the details of the American Revolution, again. There is high cost of the Seven Years' War as a, you'll write down, factor for revolution. Part of the reason for the revolution was the high cost of the American Revolution. There was a high cost. It was a factor for revolution. When you look at the map on the screen, there's all this purple that the British got. And, like, the American colonists are super excited. They're, like, super happy about all the purple on the screen. Because if you are a farmer, what might you think about doing? You're here in the 13 colonies, but now all this land is, like, British land now. What might you think about doing if you're a farmer with all this newly acquired land? Expand, right? Now, the British aren't so thrilled about that because... All this new land they got, they took over from the French. Originally, the French owned this, and there weren't a lot of, like, white French people in, like, these parts of the world. But who mainly did live in all this yellow? Native Americans did. So it's not like this land, the British have all this land now. It's not like it's empty. But the American colonists say, well, it might as well be. Because, you know, we can push off those Native Americans. We can take off their land, whatever. Listen, if that happens, if what a bunch of white 13 col uh, colony settlers start moving into that land, it's just going to start a war, right? It's going to start fighting. And if there's another war, who's responsible for defending those 13 colonies? What government's responsible? Mm -hmm. The British. And that's basically a war. Do they have money for one more war? Mm -hmm. No, because they blew out the budget. It says on the handout that there's concerns that this Newly acquired territory, they were afraid settlers would fight the Native Americans. And we don't have the money for that. We don't have the room for that in the budget. 
And so they have a solution to this. And the solution, if you look, they actually draw this purple line and they say, OK, Americans, here's a rule. You cannot move west of this line. And if you don't move west, you'll never bump with the natives. There'll be no problems. It says the proclamation of 1763 was a line that Americans were prohibited from crossing. Based on what you know about Americans, do you think that we listen to this rule? Yeah. No, we're like, yeah, I'm going to cross that line anyway. All this is leading to some serious tension. And on top of this, we see on your handout higher taxes. The British really just want to pay off the debt that they have and led on your handout to higher taxes. Some of these taxes were considered just too broad. For example, one of the taxes was the Stamp Act, which we'll write down was on all paper. I mean, can you imagine a tax on anything that was paper? The notes that you're writing perhaps right now would have had some small amount of tax put on it. So that's not good, right? It makes people upset, makes people mad. When people get upset and mad, they do some things or they may be open to things that are not great actions. In this picture, uh, what's happening in this picture? Yeah, so this guy, this poor dude, he is a, a tax collector. His job is to, you know, get stuff for the British government. And it's not like he necessarily like a loves or agrees or is like all about what the British are doing, but he just has to do his job. My job is to collect money. So crowds of people started to view this guy, the tax collectors, as the enemy. And when you are tarred and feathered, a couple things happen, can happen. One thing is that sometimes you are like beat up by a crowd. And like, again, you're just like doing your job. Like, hey, man, I don't like this either. I just, you know, it's just my job. And one thing they would do sometimes is actually strip you naked in public. Can you imagine how humiliating it would be if you got like jumped in a fight in, in, in your high school? And you weren't just being beat up by people, but like five, 10, 15 men ripped off all of your clothes and you were naked in public. It would be humiliating. And then they pour hot boiling tar on your body and then they cover you with feathers just to like mock you even more. That's terrible, right? And after it's all done and you've been beaten up and bruised and, and, and all that, what's going to happen when you start taking off those feathers or taking off the tar? It's going to be stuck. It's going to rip off some skin. This is an example on the handout of mob actions right down tar and feathered tax collectors. I don't think this is a good way to protest. You know, this is not a Gandhi way to protest. This is not a Uh, not a Martin Luther King Jr. way to protest, but this is what we do in America leading up. We do mob actions like tar and feathering. Not good. And we also know this image before. We've seen it before, probably. What is this image called? Boston Massacre. Now, if you look at this image, it's kind of interesting because who, if anyone, is the bad guy here? Yeah, the British. I mean, if you look at this guy, this guy's literally with a sword. Looks like he's saying, hey, fire. And they're all lined up. And they're all, and look, there's all these poor people. There's like a dog down there. I mean, what monsters would like shoot into a crowd or shoot into a crowd with a dog, right? Obviously, they're, they're the bad guys. And so if you open up your newspaper, you might see an image like this. And uh, it's shocking, right? Well, for you, now I know that every death is a tragedy, but how many people do you think would have to die in a shooting before you and I could call it a massacre? A hundred, okay. A hundred. I mean, I might be even willing to just get into double digits. Like if, if, if there was like a school shooting and like 17 kids were killed, I might even be willing at double digits to say massacre. Well, what about this case? How many people died in the Boston Massacre? What do you, what do you guys think? 20? A lot? We'll write down five. Now, that's 
number five may not line up with what we have popularly thought or even like the picture we're getting from the newspaper. And I could even say, listen, I got my number from the newspaper. I mean, it's called the Boston Massacre. And so what is it called when sometimes news or art can be used and manipulated to make you feel or think a certain way? What do we call that? Propaganda. Call that propaganda. And listen, we, the United States, we had propaganda because the, the reality of the story is a lot more complicated than what we've been led to believe in some of our popular summaris summarizations. For example, I already told you that crowds, mobs of angry people were like ripping people's clothes off, jumping you if you work for the British. What if you were one of these soldiers, you move to the United States, you're basically like a police officer, and you know what happens to people in red. You could be jumped. You could be mobbed. You could be, you know, beaten. And what happened in Boston, an angry crowd, a mob of people surrounded the soldiers, and they started to throw snowballs at them. Well, it's not, not a big deal, you know, snowballs, that's, that's fine. But then they started to pack the snowballs with rocks. And, I mean, could that do some damage if you have a couple hundred people throwing rocks at your head? I mean, that could definitely do some damage. And so what appears to happen is crazy situation. There's a mob of Americans. They're throwing rocks. They're yelling at you. They're, they're taunting you. And one of these British guys, it seems that he kind of like actually freaked out and shot his gun in this crazy situation. Now, if you're there, you know what's happened to tax collectors. You, you know, you've seen those images. And there's an angry crowd throwing stuff at you, rocks at your head, and the guy next to you shoots his gun. What might you do more out of instinct than of, I hate Americans? Yeah, yeah shoot yours. And it seems that's exactly what happened. It doesn't seem like any order was given to shoot. And in fact, after the gun started going off, the British commander started telling his guys, stop shooting. I never gave that order. And he calms his soldiers down. Thankfully, only five died. But that's a lot different than what this picture. This picture is showing me a calculated effort. This picture is showing me a British officer ordering the death of Americans, and that's not what happened. Now, that doesn't mean that these guys shouldn't be held accountable. If there was a police officer that accidentally shot a person, that should be investigated. Maybe they should even be put on trial. But is that the same thing as murdering someone? Is what happened here full-on calculated murder? I'm not saying they didn't kill people. I'm saying, is that calculated premeditated murder? No. Right. Yeah, there's a word for that. Let's, yeah, let's say that Annabelle's driving a car and she's been given a license and we're like, oh, whoa, that's crazy. I can't believe the world we live in. And she hits someone in her car who runs across the street. They're trying to go to the donut shop in the morning. Now, Annabelle literally hits and kills that person with her car. But that person also like ran across the street and there's witnesses. Annabelle did kill them. But did Annabelle murder that person? No. And so this is kind of like a complicated situation. Is the British officer guilty of allowing murder? What do you do? And so to figure that out, you probably have to have a trial, right? But honestly, these guys do go on trial in Boston. But now listen, if there was an advertisement saying, hey, we're looking for a lawyer to defend these guys, would you sign up for that? No, because like everyone hates these people. In fact, he could not find a lawyer that wanted to defend these people until someone stepped up. Someone famous that you guys probably should know by name. There's a guy named John Adams who says, I don't like these guys. I don't agree with these guys. I don't want anything to do with them. But everyone deserves a fair free trial. In fact, in America, we have a principle that says you're innocent until what point? Proven guilty. Who's John Adams? He's super famous. So, so he was actually George Washington's vice president, and he was our second president. John Adams said, you know what? I hate these guys, too. I don't think they belong in Boston either. But you know what? Everyone deserve, deserves a fair free trial. 
John Adams is what we would call a classical liberal. Because you know what classical liberals believe about people with different political beliefs? Their voices should be heard. They should be tolerated. That's a really interesting example. One of our founding fathers defended these people, not because he liked them, but because he said everyone deserves a fair and free trial. Boston Massacre. We also know about the Boston Tea Party. And the Boston Tea Party, we know that they dumped tea into Boston Harbor. And the reason for that, it says on the handout, is because the British had a monopoly that excluded American merchants from this lucrative profits. There's a guy you should know by name who invented capitalism. Guy you should know by name who wrote a book called Wealth of Nations. Who's that guy? No. One of the most famous men who've ever lived. We've talked about him multiple times. He was on our quiz. You should know Wealth of Nations. You should know capitalism. You should know this Scotsman wrote what made capitalism what it is today, free market. What's his name? Adam Smith. Adam Smith. Now, in general, what does Adam Smith think about the government and business? More involvement or less involvement? Less. Adam Smith says, get the heck out of business. In fact, we've talked about that there's, a philo there's an eco economic philosophy Adam Smith hated. Because there's a philosophy you in this room should all know. There's a philosophy that said a mother country should have colonies and the colonies should only sell to your mother country and only buy from your mother country. If Spain knocks on your door and says, we'll buy your products for more, you have to say no. If the Netherlands says, we would love to do business with you, you're not allowed to. What is that philosophy called? where you as a colony exist just to make your mother country money? No. Communism is where the government is taking from the rich to give to the poor. This is a philosophy that says you exist just to make your mother country money, and you can only buy from me, and you can only sell to me. It's, no, it does start with an M, though. It's called mercantilism, right? Uh, Adam Smith hated that because mercantilism is the government telling me what I can and can't do. Forget that, Adam Smith said. And that's what was happening with the Boston Tea Party. The British said, you can't sell it to other people except for us. We don't like that so much. We actually dump, it says on the handout, $2 million of tea into the harbor right now. Below that, we'll get into a man you should know by name, a guy, Thomas Paine. Now, Thomas Paine's not famous because of the bullets he shot, but for a book he wrote. Now, the thing about the American Revolution is like a lot of people were not ready to do revolution because if you're if we're calling this a revolution, what are you willing to do to a British soldier if we're like literally fighting a revolution? Kill them, right? Like, is there something that you are ready right now to do to kill someone for in 2021? I mean, probably not. And a lot of Americans similarly felt really uncomfortable with the idea that we are literally going to start killing people in an American revolution. So Thomas Paine's really important. Thomas Paine says, I am going to present some arguments. I'm going to give you some reasons for revolution. And listen, if he wants to give reasons for revolution, what philosophy is inspiring him to do that? What general philosophical movement that's all about reason? The Enlightenment, right? What is that book that Thomas Paine writes? You should all know it, having studied in eighth grade to some degree. Yeah, it's called Common Sense. Write down Thomas Paine. He wrote a book called Common Sense. That's reasons for the revolution. Thomas Paine does not write a book and say, yeah, we should revolt against the British because they suck, period. He says, I'm going to actually give you arguments because the Enlightenment is all about reason. It's about arguments. It's about evidence. That's what the Enlightenment is all about. Well, that's great and all, but let's talk about the nitty gritty of the war. And the nitty gritty of the war is a unbalanced situation because we are fighting the British. And if you don't remember, the British 
were one of the most powerful countries on the face of the planet. In fact, you should remember the British just beat the French. So they're not like a crappy army. They're one of the best on the planet. British forces, how many did they send to the United States to take care of this pesky revolution? You'll write down 50,000. That's a huge military force. This 50,000 are trained soldiers. They're professionals. They have experience. They have seen war. and co- In fact, these 50,000, some of them have even been part of that victory against the French. But 50,000 is not enough. And they also turn to a second group of people on your handout called Hessians. Two things about these people. We're going to write down where they're from and how many were sent. These are actually Germans. These are Germans. And the British say we need to hire more soldiers. And they hire 30,000 of these Hessians to help fight the war against the Americans. This is a big force. In total, we're talking about 80,000 people. That's, that's a huge amount of people. And also, the British have the luxury of having the most powerful navy on the planet. They send 400 ships, an armada of 400 ships. That's going to block our shores. It's going to bomb our cities. This is a formidable opponent that we have to deal with. But what about, uh, 400 ships. But what about us? What do we have on our side? Well, our army has a nickname. They're called the Continental Army. And the thing about our army is our guys are not like professionals. They're not like training every week, you know. Actually, our army is made up of like farmers and fishermen and trappers and blacksmiths and tailors. In fact, a good phrase for our army you'll write down is we are citizen soldiers. A citizen soldier, just like an everyday regular guy, citizen soldier. And our army of citizen soldiers, like, that's cool. But, like, there's a bad thing. Like, if you're a farmer, you're like, yeah, I'll join your army. But FYI, I got to go back to the farm because in a few months I have to have harvest time. You know, like, let's not schedule a fight during, you know, like, I don't think, like, war works like that. So this isn't, like, the best situation. And the size of our army of farmers and tailors and blah, 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 wasn't that big either. We had only about 17,000 soldiers, 17,000. So listen, the numbers are not adding up. Like if you were to place bets and say, okay, there's gonna be this fight, these two sides are gonna fight. One side, the most powerful empire on the face of the earth with a professional army of 80,000 and 400 ships. And the other one, we have some tailors and blacksmiths and farmers to have some guns that they use to hunt rabbits on the weekend who's going to win this war i'm going to go with the british right i'm going to put my bet on the british george washington's put in charge and you know they said hey man uh welcome to the continental army we want to show you around these are the soldiers these are the guys our supplies and there's good news and bad news and it was okay well what's what's the good news it's like well we got guns And we got ammunition. That's good. But listen to this account of the bad news. It says, quote, at present, there was enough powder only for nine rounds per man. In other words, hey, man, uh, you know, this is the guns. And FYI, we have enough to shoot our guns nine times and then we have to tap out. I don't know if that's going to be like a recipe for like unless we're going to hit every single guy with every bullet dead shot. This isn't going to work out. Nine shots and we're done? It says on the handout, according to one account, Washington was so stunned by the report, he didn't utter a word for half an hour. They're like, uh, something's wrong. He's, he's not even talking, you know. But that's a bad situation to be found in. And because of that, you know what? We lose battle after battle after battle. I mean, it makes sense. We're farmers. We're not skilled. We're not experienced. But there are some battles that we win, battles that matter. For example, one battle that we win, a battle that matters, the Battle of Saratoga. And this, it says on the handout, was an American victory. And the thing that this battle is so famous for is there was someone watching the war that was thinking about, should they jump in or not? Should they jump in to help? And they weren't wanting to jump in because they love America. They didn't want to jump in because like, oh, we love democracy. They jumped in for one reason. 
they hated the British. And, you know, there's a saying, we all know this, that the enemy of my enemy is my what? My friend, right? Like, if there's someone who didn't like Shelby, I'd be like, hey, tell me more, you know? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Just joking, I think Shelby's wonderful. Uh, enemy of enemy is my friend. And who's the enemy of the British? France. So France, by the way, has a king. And it's not like France is like, oh, we love democracy and freedom. France is only thinking about jumping in because they want to mess with the British. Because the British beat them in the Seven Years' War. And so when the Americans beat the British in this one battle, they say, you know what? I think we might want to think about giving the Americans some uh, guns. We might want to give them some money. We want to give the Americans some uh, ammunition. We might actually even send some soldiers over. It says on the handout that this would win French support, the Battle of Saratoga. The war would ultimately come to a conclusion at the Battle of Yorktown. The British have a general, a guy named Cornwallis, and it says Americans win and the British surrender. This is like the most shocking thing that's ever happened because who would have bet the most powerful country on the planet would surrender to 13 colonies of farmers and fishermen? Like that literally doesn't make any sense. In fact, this was such a crazy moment that the British surrendered to us that when they were signing the surrender and they were doing the deal and all that, there was a famous song at the time that was popular. And the song that was popular was called The World Turned Upside Down. And that's just a song kind of like if, if our world flipped and turned upside down and up was down and down was up, left was right, right was left, that'd be weird. And they said, you know what? This is the craziest thing we've ever seen. Let's play this song. The World Turned Upside Down. We'll write on the handout by that. This was played during the surrender. It was played during the surrender because this is literally the craziest thing that's ever happened. How in the world is the most powerful nation on the planet surrendering to 13 small fragmented colonies? A lot of these guys are like illiterate farmers. How's this even a thing? The war comes to a, an official end with a treaty piece of paper called the Treaty of Paris. And before the American Revolution, if, if you take a look, before the revolution, everything in yellow or orange, whatever you want to call this, is the British. But we win our independence, and guess what? We get everything in pink, which is impressive. What body of water is this that is our western border of the pink? What body of water is that? Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, what body of water is this one right here? Right. That's, you know, you should know. There's a few bodies of water you should know. And you should probably know, like, the longest river in the United States. That's the Mississippi. And this treaty says we get everything, 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 east of the Mississippi, you'll write down. And that's amazing because, like, no Americans lived there before. No Americans, like, live in these states before. We got this. We doubled the size of our country by signing a piece of paper, the Treaty of Paris, which is cool. And this is, like, step one of something we believe in. What is that called that we believe that we're going to go from one coast to the other coast eventually? It's, it's meant to be. It's called Manifest Destiny. You see, it's back there somewhere. We believe it's our destiny to go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific. And with this, I'm one third of the way there. That's good news for us. So after the deal is signed, now the hard part begins. We have to come up with rules to have for our new country. And the first set of rules we have is called the Articles of Confederation, which turns out were terrible. It was like the worst idea ever. One of the problems with the Articles, we'll write down, was that we had a weak central government. What I mean by that was we actually didn't even have a president. 
during the Articles of Confederation. What I mean by that is actually every state had its own money. So like if I'm going to I'm going to Massachusetts for the weekend, I better get Massachusetts money because I live in New York. Like is this kind of like everyone did their own thing? No one was in charge. And ultimately, the Articles of Confederation were so bad, it was rejected. And we had to get together to replace it. And guess what we replaced the Articles of Confederation with? The Constitution. In fact, at the Constitutional Convention of 1787, we, it says on your handout, replaced the Articles. So we replaced the Articles. What makes the Constitution so special? Well. I want to avoid having a king. Kings are all powerful. Kings do whatever they want. Kings ask for something, and then they get something. How can I avoid having a king again? Well, we decide a really important part of our Constitution is we have separation of powers. Instead of, like, one man in charge, how many branches of government do we have? Not two. We have three, write down three branches. Now, you should know this, that if I want a bill to become a law, first I need to start in Congress. But listen, even Congress has more than one part. How many parts are there in Congress? There's two. The largest part of Congress, which gives a representative for how many people live in your state, so that states like California and Texas, New York, and Florida have a lot more than the state of Rhode Island or Alaska, what part of Congress is that that's based on population? No. No, young ace scholar. Young, we're paying for your college. It's the House of Representatives. That, no, totally different. The House of Representatives, you don't have to write this down, just overviewing stuff you should know. You can if, if you want. But in the three branches, we have judicial, legislative, executive, you should know that. And in the legislature, we have the House of Representatives. That's cool, pass the law there. But after I pass it in the House, where does it have to go next in Congress? It goes to the second part. What's the second part called? The Senate. How many senators do we get per state, by the way? Two per state. And it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter the size, because we have two, and little baby Rhode Island has two. So it has to pass the House, it has to go to the Senate, and then after Congress passes it, what happens to the bill next before it becomes a law? Who has to check off? Who has to say, I agree? The president, right? Now, if the president doesn't like that bill, what could he do to it? He could veto it, and let's say even if he signs it, let's say that the law is like full-on racist, who can strike down that law? Because someone can. Sir? Who has the power to strike down a law that Congress and the president have signed? The courts. The third branch. The third branch is the court system. And even if you pass a law, even if the president signs the law, if the courts look at the law and say, that law is not right, that law can be thrown out. It turns out it's really hard to have a law in America. It turns out it's kind of like slow to get stuff done on purpose, because you know who moves fast? Dictators do. You know who gets whatever they want right away? Kings do. And you know what the United States did not want to repeat? They don't want any of that. They want checks and balances to keep government from doing whatever they want. It says on your handout, we have another system of checks and balances, a word that we don't talk a lot about, but it's important called federalism. Tomorrow is March 10th, 2021. What happens in Texas on March 10th, 2021 that makes half the people happy, half the people mad? The mask mandate, it comes to an end tomorrow. What that means is like right now, you are required to wear a mask to go to Kroger, required to wear a mask to go into a restaurant, required to wear a mask when you walk into Chili's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Required by the government. Tomorrow, the mask mandate comes to an end. And tomorrow, it's up to individual businesses to decide. For example, 
H-E-B has announced you still have to wear a mask. But they say you have to wear it because we want you to wear the mask, not because we're told by the government. Maybe random bar X on Spencer Highway says, no, we don't want it. Tomorrow, it's up to everyone to make their own decision. Now, Joe Biden does not like this. Joe Biden says this is terrible. Joe Biden says people are going to die. Joe Biden says this is the worst thing ever. But you know what? Joe Biden cannot do anything about it because every state has their own rights. That's called federalism. Our state capital is what city? Austin. That's where our governor lives. Every state has their own rights. We have reopened our schools in LaPorte. California has not. Illinois has not. Florida has reopened their schools. Every state gets to decide what they want to do. That's called federalism. It says on your handout, the government is divided among, and the space is not big enough, you'll make it work somehow. It's divided among state and federal government. State and federal government. Our state capital is Austin. Where's our federal capital for the entire country? Washington, D.C., right? We have two capitals that impact my life. What happens in Austin impacts my life. Austin says, no more mask mandate tomorrow. D.C. says, various different laws. There are two capitals. There's my state capital, and there is my federal capital. Finally, last thing, sad thing about rights. Who are the people in this new republic that get to vote at first? Rich women? Yes. So we have rights, we'll write down for rich land owning men. Those are the only ones with voting rights. Rich land owning men. Not all people can vote in America. Not all men can vote in America. Not all white men can vote in America. It was only land-owning white men that could vote in America. And in this way, the promises of the Declaration are not fulfilled. Jefferson said all men are created equal, and by men he meant men and women. That was what he did mean. But the promise of the declaration is not fulfilled yet. There is still work to do. We are going to stop there. And I want to look at 